Right, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in between. It's time for us to start. Good, well thank you very much for coming back from the beautiful sunshine outside. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, who's come from the University of Calgary. Professor Marcello Tonelli um, ha has a number of senior leadership roles in health research, clinical research, and is also a nephrologist. Uh, and therefore, it's a real pleasure to ask him to address us uh, about... What are you going to talk about, Marcello? <laughs> Patient-centered kidney care. Floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the, uh, the opportunity to speak. I really appreciate the chance to be here. As Fiona said, I'm a nephrologist and um, I work in Calgary, which is a medium-sized province in, in Western Canada. So it's about, uh, only about two and a half times uh, the size of the United Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> like, the, um, like the organization here today, Kidney Research UK, I, I got my research start from uh, our, a very similar organization in Canada called the Kidney Foundation in Canada. So it's great to see an event like this. Um, there are some uh, real advantages of having a community like this. We have one in Canada, but I think you're a little bit better developed here, and I'll definitely take back some of the things that I've seen here today. I um, would like to point out just a couple of relevant things about the Canadian healthcare system. We have a universal healthcare system like the UK, meaning that everyone can receive care. There's a, a couple of small twists. We don't have any private health care at all. Um, and there is a fee-for-service structure for physicians, which is very good if you're a physician. It means you have a lot of autonomy and, and you earn more money. But it's very bad from a policy perspective because every, it seems like every time you want to do something to make things better for patients or for the system, there's a financial barrier. So I was asked to speak a little bit about the Alberta Kidney Disease Network, which is our research organization, and I found it difficult to work this in, so I'll just present this at the beginning. The AKDN is a clinically focused research organization based at the two universities in Alberta, so the University of Calgary and the University of Edmonton. And these, um, sorry, having some difficulty with my slides here. The, these, these are the, the three people, so me and Brenda Hemelgarn and Braden Mann, we, we started this organization in about 2004. And at, the, at that time, we were all junior faculty members, um, we're all nephrologists, working in, in Edmonton and Calgary separately. We had very different research interests. Braden is a health economist. Uh, Brenda was focused more on clinical trials, and I was doing dialysis epidemiology and population health services. And over the next 10 years, our interests converged, and we did a lot of work focusing together on CKD-related health services. And over time, we added these other people, Scott uh, Clarenbach and Nish Panu. Um, all five of us are, are full professors, nephrologists working in the two centers, and we've had the opportunity to bring on a number of people, including our former trainees. And working for the AKDN is the best part of my job. These people are my friends, they're, they're my colleagues, and we've been able to do uh, a number of things working as a unit. And so that is really the context for the rest of this talk. Um, in Canada, we do have the opportunity to do sabbaticals. So in 2013, I started uh, a distance master's degree in health policy at Imperial College in London. And I did this because a lot of our research was increasingly focusing on policy. We were being asked to restructure care and running into barriers like the ones I mentioned earlier, like fee-for-service made it difficult or there was some other policy-related issue. And I felt I did not know enough about how health policy worked to do a good job with this aspect of my research. And, of course, no one in their right mind would go to the United States to learn about health policy. <laughs> and we don't have a lot of good opportunities in Canada, so this led me to Imperial, and I had a very good experience there, I would say. I spent a number of weeks living in London during this time and I had the chance to look at the papers and uh, British people, my impression is you're very critical, very self-critical um, and one of the key targets for your criticisms is your NHS, which I think does a very good job uh, under, under uh, very uh, difficult circumstances, especially in recent years. I think there's a lot that the rest of the world can learn from the NHS, so I was surprised to see uh, the tone with which it's addressed in the, in the national media. 
I, I learned a lot of things during my master's degree, and it was, uh, you know, from a personal perspective, it was great to go back and be a student again um, after you know being a professor. It's, it's good for the ego, for sure, um, uh, being put in your place properly by your, by your professors. But uh, there were a couple of other spin-off benefits, and one of them was having the chance to see what you have done in the United Kingdom with patient-centeredness. And you know, when I looked in your hospitals, I saw these kinds of frameworks on the wall. It's easy to put a bit of paper up on the wall, but my impression was the health system was really doing its best to address these aspects of care. And I was impressed also by what I saw of this Involve organization, which is much further ahead than anything we have in Canada in terms of integrating patient goals, patient objectives into the research enterprise and the clinical enterprise. So it got me thinking, how could we do better in Canada? And as I said, uh, in the AKDN, our research interests had already converged once, and now they've started to diverge again, the three principles. We still work together very closely, uh, talk almost daily. Uh, but this was one thing that, that we were starting to think about, was how could we focus on patient-centered care? How could we study it? How could we implement it uh, in the health system for the benefit of patients? And of course, the difficulty with this phrase is it really doesn't mean anything. It's, you see it everywhere, but on its own, what does it mean? And so this was our first challenge, was to try and get to the bottom of what, what are the goals? And again, I found it very helpful to look at how things stand in the UK as a model of what this could mean if it was done properly. So what I'm gonna talk about is just our thoughts in Alberta, where we have gotten to thinking about how patient-centeredness might influence chronic kidney disease care in the two spheres of dialysis and CKD non-dialysis care. It's important to note that transplantation would be very, very important to talk about, but I'm just not going to speak about it here just in the interest of time. What I am going to talk about is um, patient priorities in research and patient preferences for treatment when thinking about dialysis. And for me, in the chronic kidney disease sphere, there are many different ways in which patient-centeredness could be thought about. And I'm going to think of, talk about multimorbidity, which I think is the key challenge facing all health systems right now. How do we think about and deal with multimorbidity? but through a patient-centered lens. So starting with dialysis then, I think a backdrop for all of us, no surprise, we've had lots of fantastic basic science, lots of great hypotheses, and carefully done clinical trials. And the difficulty has been that all of these trials have failed to show a significant benefit, or at least a conclusive large benefit. So this has been something that we've all had to grapple with and think about. Um, and at the same time, when any, any of us that see patients in the dialysis unit can see that there's a real disconnect uh, between what we are talking about as clinicians and what the patient is thinking. Here is a typical encounter. Uh, the, the, clinical, the clinical team might be thinking about what the online KT over V is, a number. They might be thinking about the blood flow, another number, or these other lab-based numbers, hemoglobin and phosphorus. Whereas on the other side of the chair, the patient is thinking about very different things. They're thinking about, you know, there's 20 nephrologists in my group, so we split up the evening shifts and so on. Why do I always have to see someone different? Why are you nagging me about what I eat and what I drink? Is there any way that I could make dialysis shorter and still get the benefits? And, you know, symptoms, always symptoms. And from a nephrologist perspective, you're sort of saying, well, you know, I can't really help you very much with that symptom. Or, try and blame it on the patient somehow, somehow link it to their phosphorus even though the, the data linking phosphorus with itch is extremely weak. So anyway, the point is there is this disconnect and there are some commonalities I would say. I think that we, we both are interested in transplant workup and modality choice, but a lot of the other stuff is very different. Nephrologists are thinking about numbers and clinical targets. Patients are thinking about a much broader array of things, some of which are very, would be very easy to fix or might be easier to fix than some of these if we turned our mind to it. So I think the first thought was setting priorities for research. And as I've already said, in the UK, you are further ahead in this respect. But this is something that we're, we're thinking a lot about in Alberta, is making this case to our colleagues, and especially to those who work in basic research, is the importance of getting patients to set the priorities. And just from an editorial perspective, um, as Fiona mentioned, I have a, a leadership role in our university, and when I speak with research funders, especially national funders, I get the impression that the days where scientists decided what they're gonna study, I think they're really coming to an end. I think increasingly we're gonna be, be see more and more demands make this relevant for the stakeholders. Now, who are the stakeholders? In your country, my country, a stakeholder could be government that funds the healthcare, 
It could be a company that wants a product to meet a need, or it could be, and I think the most important stakeholder of all is patients. And I think the time is now for us to put our house in, house in order so that we're prepared to, to make our research relevant before we start seeing uh, a litany of cuts to our research agenda. And I think this is really the key, is that if you're only pragmatic, if you don't care a hoot about what the patients actually think, this is sort of the bottom line, is increasing the support for research. But I think for, for those of us that have other concerns, you know, there are a lot of very basic reasons why it makes sense to involve patients in the research agenda. And, and this, I think, is, is front and center there. So this has been part of what we've been working on, is making this case to basic scientists. We've been thinking, um, uh, we, in this case, the university, how do you, how do you get basic scientists thinking about patient-centered problems? What's the right way to bring the communities together so that they can learn? And we have some ideas, but I'd be interested to know what you are, what you are doing in this respect. So that's the why. Again, the UK leading, when we went to look to see, well, how would we involve patients in setting research agenda, this organization, the James Lind Alliance, rose to the top. So it, it, it's been around for, uh, I think, uh, a couple of decades. It has, uh, its purpose is to involve people in deciding the research agenda for a variety of different conditions. And they, they work on these four groups. They have patients, those that are involved in the care of the patients and their families, the people providing the care, and the people who need the results of the research to inform their work, either policymakers or other types of decision makers. They have a structured process where they uh, use modified Delphi and survey-based techniques to arrive at a consensus, and these are the people setting the agenda. Uh, my understanding is the first set of priorities that they came up with was for diabetes. And looking at that list of priorities, it's really neat. You can see the hand of the patients. And there was a bit of a compare and contrast exercise that someone did showing what the diabetes community was working on as compared with uh, what this list showed. And there's been some movement and some convergence, which I think is very positive. So Braden Mans from our team led a national exercise to identify the top 10 research priorities for dialysis patients and published it in CJSON uh, two years ago. Now I'm not going to show you the whole list, I'm just going to show you these three. Um, top priority, how can I <coughs> communicate better? How, what can we learn about how we can communicate better? Is there a role for new technologies? Is there a role for decision aids? Question two was about dialysis modalities and not just their um, how do I choose, but what are the benefits? This comes back to one of the previous presentations. I think that part <coughs> about communicating the differences between the different modalities, including conservative care, is one of the key challenges that we face in this area. So this was priority two. Priority three was about a symptom. Now the, of the top 10, three had to do with symptoms. And this particular symptom, pruritus, uh, comes up. I've been thinking a bit about pruritus. Why is it that we know so little about it? We understand how we would get to the bottom of it. You don't have to read this slide. It's just to show that we know if we wanted to get to the bottom of this problem, we could. We would start with the basic epidemiology. We would look, based on the epidemiology, we would start looking at pathophysiology. We would develop treatments that targeted that pathophysiology, test them in an iterative fashion until we found a couple that worked, and so on. When we had effective therapies, we would translate them to the bedside, make them a quality target, and so on. But we've done none of these things. And even when you look back at the evidence supporting something like phosphorus, the, the evidence base for that, minuscule, was done with a case control study, if I'm not mistaken, with about 35 patients. So really, we don't know what causes pruritus, and we don't have a plan. Now, one of the concrete things that came out of this list was, in our center, we have a cohort of incident dialysis patients that have been phenotyped <coughs> and biobanked. We have blood from all of them. And so we also have a, an index of itch, a five-point scale, Likert. And we're going to just do some of these simple analyses. How, what are, what is the burden? How does it evolve over time? Who are the people that have the most pruritus? What are their characteristics? And we also, because we have blood banked and because our center happens to be a world leader in metabolomics, we're going to run um, a metabolomics panel on these specimens to see if any markers rise to the top as being associated with pruritus. Now, I don't know a lot about this. I don't know whether it will yield fruit, but at least it's a start. We will also, in parallel, test the best therapies that people are currently prescribing, things like ultraviolet light, things like skin emollients, and possibly naltrexone. So we'll do these things. I think one of the interesting things has been the serendipitous nature of the way in which breakthroughs might be made. So I was highlighting this 
in fact, uh, Braden was highlighting this at a conversation at which several of us were present. One of the colleagues was a basic scientist, a very good basic scientist whose work is in pain. And he said, oh, isn't that interesting? I didn't know that your patients were itchy. Did you know that the mechanisms which cause itch are very similar to those which cause pain? I mean, maybe that's basic biology. I didn't know it. And he said, you know, if you want to make progress here, you should get a bunch of us that do pain. Come to, come to one of the seminars, and maybe we can work something out. Some of the agents that we're using might be effective for itch. So I thought that was interesting, and I think it just highlights the, the importance of a multidisciplinary approach to these kinds of problems. Now, we look back. This talk is on patient-centeredness. And one of the things that keeps coming up, the further we get with this, is that if you look at what we proposed here, where are the patients? They're absent. So even when you start tackling a patient-centered problem with the best of intentions, it's going to require a real rethink to how do we make sure that patients are at each stage of this so that we're not just taking an idea from patients and then running with it. We want to integrate patients, and we are still learning how to do that. So that's pruritus. I want to just change gears for a moment and talk back about the patient priorities. One thing that patients routinely say is, you know, dialysis, I really appreciate it. I don't have to pay for it. It keeps me alive. But you, boy, you do a terrible job from the customer service perspective. And you know, you have to agree. Um, I don't know how things work in the United Kingdom. This is how things work in Canada. We have three shifts a day on average. They start pretty much at the same time. There's some staggering in here, but not much. And people spend their time in these shifts. The staffing is based on uh, the staff that are needed to cope with this peak. So during this period of time, I am not for one second saying that uh, our, our busy staff uh, don't do, uh, don't, aren't busy, but during these times, they are clearly less busy and underutilized than, than they are during these spikes. So this person, Dr. Kamenda, he's a nephrologist who did some business school training, and he went away and did some time and motion analyses, and this is just his idea, this is a schematic, that points out that the limited time, the bottleneck, is the time actually connected to the machine receiving dialysis. And if we can optimize that time, we can make better use of the patient's time in the unit and optimize the patient experience. So his idea is to structure everything on that and to do as much as possible, everything that doesn't need to be done actually connected to the machine is not. So everything, including needling, is done out here. Patients begin dialysis the moment they sit in the chair. You have special teams, as we do now, that act on distinct aspects of the care but that if there's anything that needs to be done once the treatment is finished, whether that's recovery for a low blood pressure or if someone's bleeding a little longer than expected, right now, we do all those things in the chair and that holds up other people. I don't know, are you doing something different? So this is very, very basic time and motion analysis. It once again highlights the importance of a multidisciplinary approach. We just happen to have a nephrologist who is interested in this. So if we're serious about improving these things and tackling what the patients want us to do, we're gonna need people with new skills. We've started working with people from the business school. We've had no meaningful input from them yet, but we suspect there's a lot of other, we suspect there's a lot of other processes that they could, they could help us with if we're able to get them to the unit so they can see what the patients face. I think, you know, it's really strange to point to an airline, especially to United Airlines, as a model of customer service. But here is something that they do well. They let you know what's going on. And we don't do that either. We, the person sits in the chair, they're worrying, when am I going to get on? Am I going to get off at a time which means that I'm going to miss my bus? If, if we just put up there how long it's going to be, what we're waiting for, it would cost us nothing. It would be the cost of a TV screen. But we could give better information to the people. And this, uh, this is what the patients are saying. Just tell us. I can handle a wait. Just let me know. <coughs> am I going to wait or am I going to go on now? I can call someone to help me. So this is another aspect of customer service which I think is potentially important. So interim summary on dialysis, I think we could focus, we need to focus on symptoms, we could think about customer service, but we really have to start with what the patients are telling us. And I want to emphasize that I am not suggesting for one moment that we abandon the current paradigms. I think there's a lot we can learn from the work that's already been done. I'm sure we're going to make progress with metabolic bone disease, for example, if we keep working away at it, but it's just a shift in focus to complement what we are currently doing. So what about chronic kidney disease? Now, as I've alluded to, I think that um, in chronic kidney disease, one of the key challenges is multimorbidity. Our patients have many different problems, and those problems interact with each other, and they can be a distraction for focusing on what is really going on. What is, what is multimorbidity? Well, we are used to, in nephrology, uh, really all medical specialties, 
patients have a disease, in this case kidney disease, and then they have these other things which are also going on. They have heart disease, diabetes, whatever it is. But the key is that the kidney disease is the focus and not the person. Whereas if you start thinking about it from a multimorbid perspective, this is a person that has a number of different conditions. No one condition is most important, but the key is that they interact. I actually think it's a little unrealistic for kidney, kidney professionals to, to not think that kidney disease comes first. So how I think of it is that I think about multimorbidity in a person who has kidney disease. So what does that subtle shift in emphasis mean? What it means is instead of tackling the diseases one at a time, and say for example, now we're gonna apply our guideline on diabetes, now we're gonna apply our guideline on hypertension, now we're gonna apply it on heart failure. Instead, we think about these conditions together. And this has impact for quality measures, it has potential uh, measures uh, impact for the treatments that we apply, and it, it, it certainly has a potential impact on how the, the patient's role in prioritizing the interplay between these different conditions. So this is a classic article in the field, now a little more than 10 years old. It, it just looked at a person, an elderly person, who really, by nephrology standards, this is not a very complex patient. They have osteoarthritis, they have osteoporosis, diabetes, hypertension, and chronic lung disease. Well, you know, we see this is a mildly affected patient by nephrology standards. But this is the schedule for guidelines. The guidelines suggested this person should be doing. These are the medication-related ones. These are the non-medication-related ones. This person's day was full of recommended activities. Now, if you make this person have moderate chronic kidney disease as well, we can start to think, I mean, what are the issues? Well, first of all, this person is complex, at least they're complex for by in absolute standards. There are some conflicting objectives which may come, come about. So if you have someone that has an exacerbation of their lung disease, but they also have diabetes, at least you're gonna be thinking about, well, what's the impact of that going to be? There are also other, I don't consider this to be very significant. If the person needs steroids for their lung disease, okay, who cares about the blood sugar for a few days? But there are times, I think, where it becomes more important. And my impression is that we currently handle these in rather a paternalistic fashion. A person that has arthritis, don't take an NSAID. Your blood pressure may go up. It may be bad for your GFR. Well, my, this is an example of my wife and I. My wife's also a physician. We talk about this all the time. My wife's an anesthetist, so she's always trying to give NSAIDs to people. And I think I have her, uh, acclimatized now, but I, I may have gone too far the other way because post-operative pain, NSAID, I mean, it's an easy, an easy question for me. My point is more that in the clinic, really, instead of banning the NSAID or making the GP be, feel bad about prescribing an NSAID, we should make this about risks and benefits. The risks associated with NSAIDs, sure, there are people that get in big trouble with NSAIDs, but most people don't, and if you monitor them, it's probably preventable. So the point here is that there are conflicting objectives, but in order to take a more patient-centered approach, we should be getting guidance from the patient routinely about how to manage that conflict, rather than deciding in the form of practice guidelines that say NSAIDs are contraindicated when the GFR is less than 30. In our population, we have a specific issue with lack of evidence. Um, you know, do we know whether the guideline says use a bisphosphonate, but does it really work when someone has CKD? There, that's a special problem in our area. And then, of course, there's the diet, um, which only gets more complex the, the more problems that people have. So there are some very real issues related to multimorbidity. I think key challenges for us, uh, when we think about how to apply a, uh, something like um, a guideline, I'll just skip forward to that. There are some special challenges for guidelines, producers. There's interactions between conditions. So for example, someone who has depression and diabetes, there's a lot of talk right now in the diabetes world that you should treat the depression first that will help the patient get their symptoms under control I mean that might be a good idea but the point being again this is something that you, uh, you you should probably check on that with the patient before proceeding with that we've already talked about treatment by condition interactions where someone has uh, one condition like uh, low GFR and they may need an NSAID for another condition there may be interactions between treatments like warfarin and antibiotics and I think very relevant for our, our population is interactions between life expectancy versus palliation. Should we really be doing mammograms and dialysis patients? I mean, clearly not. It doesn't make any sense to be routinely doing them. There may be some dialysis patients in whom it, in, in whom it is beneficial, and there again it comes back to a discussion about preferences between, with the patient. 
The key that I'm trying to, the point that I'm trying to make is currently our guidelines don't consider these issues. They talk about people as if they have one disease. They don't talk about the different conditions in parallel, and they don't generally incorporate the preferences of the patient. I have been very impressed by the nice preliminary guidance on multimorbidity. I think it is way ahead of anything anyone else has done, and we will be trying to learn lessons from that in Canada. There are some other particular challenges related to multimorbidity in kidney care. One, one key factor for us in Canada, again, one of the poisonous things about fee-for-service is it makes these things challenging. If you have five or six things to do, it's a lot easier to provide guideline concordant care, meaning take this drug. That's a lot quicker. You can get on to the next patient quicker to do that than it is to actually have a discussion with the patient about which of these two conditions should we prioritize today. So definitely some challenges to deal, to deal with. Um, what we realized was that we don't have any of the basic epidemiology uh, to deal with multimorbidity in kidney populations. So we decided to do our own study. Now this, uh, these are data from um, Alberta provincial health data. It's in, it includes all of the 3.5 million adults that were insured at the time we began the study, which was uh, approximately 2012. And so um, really what this slide shows is the burden of, of morbidities by age. And so the people with the light color, they have no morbidities. And the, uh, you can see that there's many fewer people in the kidney population that have no morbidities. The people with the darker colors are those that have seven or eight uh, morbidities. And again, they're much more common at every age than those with normal kidney function. And that's in addition to kidney disease. So these people have kidney disease plus one morbidity. So no big surprise, a lot of multimorbidity. Um, here, we, what, one thing we were very interested in was to try and find the most frequent combinations of comorbidities so that we could identify those that might be specially targeted in particular clinics. And what we found is it was really about uh, 10 or 12 conditions that account accounted for most of the most common combinations of conditions. Probably no real surprises. For me, qualitatively, the, the biggest surprises were how common atrial fibrillation is among those with multimorbidity and how common chronic lung disease is. I guess my eye has been glazing over those conditions in clinic because I haven't noticed them uh, to the same extent as I had stroke and myocardial infarction, which I thought would be front and center. So we did some work on this, trying to identify combinations of comorbidities, and then we very quickly correlated how multimorbidity relates to outcomes and costs and the likelihood of hospitalization. Now from an epidemiologist, this slide is super satisfying. Anytime you see rate ratios that get up to eight and 10, and when we got out to four, five, six, seven, eight comorbidities, we saw beautiful hazard ratios. So I was very enthusiastic about this slide. I came home and I, I, I just said, hey, I did this great paper at dinner. And so my family's a fantastic reality check for me. My 13-year-old uh, <laughs> son said, yeah, what did you find? So I said, uh, I just said it in kind of doctor language and my, my wife laughed. And he, my son said, oh, well, well, what did he say? And I said, well, people that have more morbidities are more likely to get sick or go into hospital. And he could not stop laughing. <laughs> I said, you, know, you are a scientist? They pay you for this? <laughs> so OK, reality check finished. Um, I was still quite pleased with the figure. Um, what we did is we went on to, um, to, to look at trying to, to develop the population attributable risks. This is what decision makers are often interested in. If we could eliminate this disease, what impact would we have on, say, hospitalization? And again, probably some of these are very obvious, like uh, things like stroke. But there were some, for us, uh, the biggest lesson from this particular slide was the importance of these four conditions, alcohol abuse, pain, depression, and schizophrenia. And what this really told us was we have no concerted approach for dealing with any of these conditions. Now probably this one you could argue is more of a societal, I mean all of them are societal to some extent, but this one, by the time someone is hospitalized for alcohol abuse, there, there, there probably should have been some upstream factors that, uh, that had been dealt with. But these are things we don't deal well with, but which should be, particularly the middle two, should be manageable. And so this has been a lesson for us about who are the people that we need to include in our teams if we're going to make an impact. So a quick summary uh, of this set of findings is that really, Yes, concordant morbidities, those that we think about, discordant morbidities like atrial fibrillation and lung disease, but especially these other mental health, pain, substance abuse, they are things we need to be thinking about to make a difference. The challenge, of course, is that we don't know enough yet how to go about this, in, especially in a patient-centric fashion. So what are the next steps? So here is what we are thinking about. 
We are increasingly working with primary care clinicians, what you would call uh, GPs, and with nurse practitioners because we don't have enough uh, nephrologists or other specialists to look after this care. But the um, part of the challenge is that the, is supporting. How do we support the primary care practitioners to do this work? We are very interested in the concept of joint clinics where we get together with uh, so patients tell us, I hate going to see you, and then I have another appointment to see the cardiologist, and then I have another appointment to see uh, this other specialist. That's been a key issue. We're not sure how to manage it, but one of our early thoughts has been that we have joint clinics about key clusters. So we have like a mental health pain type of a service that does clinics together with nephrologists, and maybe we do something similar with diabetes, just because so many of our patients are going to both endocrine and renal, and renal clinics. So those are our first thoughts. We have been trying to identify factors that lead to who are the patients that can be managed in primary care and who are the patients that should be referred. How do we differentiate between them? And we've made good progress there. We have an agreed set of referral criteria, which everyone has agreed to, and which we've been able to implement on a provincial level. We're trying to identify which are the conditions that are preventable in our patients. So, um, uh, what are the things that are markers of good ambulatory care? How can we support those? And how can we ensure that fewer of our patients are hospitalized for something that could have been dealt with in ambulatory care? And increasingly, we're thinking about this issue of primary care support. And I just want to highlight these particular uh, initiatives, the progress that we made in recent months. So my colleague, Brenda Hemmelgarn, has spent a lot of time on the CKD pathway. It's available on the internet. It's not particularly earth-shattering, but it is accessible. It is agreed. And it has been pilot tested with lots and lots of primary care practitioners. And so it gives advice on what is kidney disease, what stage is it, uh, what management should be uh, recommended, and who should the primary care physician consider referral. There's been a large dissemination effort, so people are using it, and we are studying its impact in a time series and a, a separate uh, cluster-based RCT. So we will be able to see what impact this pathway had on the management of patients. Importantly, one of the things that we, we kept getting from, uh, from patients and from providers was, you know, my doctor does my blood work far too frequently or, or not enough. Um, I'm, I'm either worried about not, not knowing what's going on or, or I feel like I'm having all of these unnecessary blood draws. We got agreement from physicians and from, uh, we got input from patients about what was reasonable and what the rationale was for it. And these frequencies are based on that and available on the internet. Now, one of the things that primary care practitioners told us was, well, you know, the pathway doesn't really cover, uh, doesn't cover all eventualities, and um, it's nice that you have it, but sometimes I just want to speak to you. Now, again, the difficulty with fee-for-service is if something's not paid for, there's less incentive to do it. And so primary care practitioners, they're not really paid to get nephrologists on the telephone. So they were, it's easier for them to fill out a consult sheet and refer the patient which the patient may want, for example, if they want reassurance, but often they don't want it because it's another appointment. Um, I, for example, there are many patients that live one, two, three hours by road away from, 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 from where my practice is, so it's a pain to go for an unnecessary consultation. So this e-consultation is an attempt to address this. It's embedded within a provincially accessible uh, electronic medical record. Things are triaged within 48 hours. It does not accept inappropriate referrals. It won't take a referral for acute kidney injury, for example, but it will accept referrals for chronic disease. You have a space, as you see, here's what the, the physician has to type in a little bit. This links to their lab test, so we can see by clicking on this name, we can see all of the lab work that they've had done, and then we can put back a response. There's also an opportunity to attach external documents, if, if possible. So from the patient perspective, uh, this, this has been very uh, popular. People like this. Um, we are, it will go online next month and will be tested in a, uh, in a again, a, a stepped wedge design where we can examine the impact of this in practices that are using it versus practices that aren't. And an important outcome measure, our primary outcome measure, is patient satisfaction. What did patients think of their experience with e-consultation? So I'm excited about that. There are some other things that we are currently working on, which is, <coughs> related to these, this idea of clusters of morbidities. And again, the example of someone with, with kidney disease who also has ar arthritis and an NSAID is contemplated, that's an example of how do we get to the bottom of reconciling that at the level of a guideline. And we're going to build up from there to more complex, more difficult clusters to deal with. 
our ultimate goal is to influence not just clinical management but potentially practice guidelines. After spending um, uh, two years uh, as a student in, in health policy, I'm very interested in how we might use policy as a tool to address this objective. We are thinking about, one of the nice things about Alberta is we can't give ourselves raises, but we can reallocate the funds that we're paid. So if we think that behavior A is good to incent, we can take money that we're paid for some other service and put it into that new service. And so we're hoping that we can use these as a tool to incent good referrals and discourage uh, referrals that are unnecessary. There's a lot of negotiation that's required, as you, as you can imagine, but this is where we are, we are working on. And we're optimistic that we'll be able to get buy-in to change these things one at a time. And so one early success has been there was a code that family physicians could bill for the establishment of a joint care plan. They had to sit down with their patient, put something in writing about what they were going to accomplish during the course of the year. Both had to sign it, and then it would be filed. And that paid uh, a decent sum of money. Family physicians uh, liked it. But kidney disease was not on the list. So we were able to successfully lobby and get kidney disease added to that. And we have a study which is in the underworks now to see, well, what impact did that have on the management of the patients for whom a care plan was completed? So there are opportunities to do these kinds of policy relevant studies and, and that's certainly part of our thinking for the future. Um, the next, I think some of the things that, we're, that, we're, that are in the hopper that we're working about is deprescription. A top patient priority was the number of medicines, um, the median number of pills per day, uh, 18 in hemodialysis patients with a very long tail with some people taking 20, 30 tablets a day. Why are all these tablets needed? Can we stop some of them? I think all of us are aware that many of the drugs we prescribe either have limited efficacy or, or maybe even no efficacy. How do we have that discussion, first of all, with our colleagues, because not everyone agrees about which drugs should be started or stopped, and how do we provide the patients with meaningful, easy to understand information about the risks and benefits of continuing on with one drug versus, uh, versus say, stopping it. One of the focus groups was really interesting. We had a group of patients there, we were talking about these things, and one of the people who hadn't said anything said, yeah, well, actually, you know, I just stopped taking all of my medicines uh, unilaterally about a year ago, and I, I haven't actually told anyone. When, I, when the patients come, when the doctors come around, I tell them I'm still taking things, I still get my refills, but I pour them all out. So this was kind of a, an interesting, I mean, I'm sure it's not at all uncommon, but this just highlights that if we don't have these discussions, we're going to, uh, you know, we are already, we are already not doing a good job and people are already doing some of this deep prescription for us. I'm struck that, um, so we're doing a, we're starting, we have a pilot trial of deep prescription complete and we are starting with a uh, with planning for a national trial of deep prescription in hemodialysis patients. We are struck that decision aids are widely used in other areas of medicine. They are used in some areas of nephrology, but there's a lot of potential, I think. Uh, we've seen a couple of examples today already where decision aids are, would, be, would be ideal, maybe are already being used. We have hired an expert in producing decision aids, and we plan to start working first on modality choice. So I was intrigued to see the, the discussion from the earlier speaker about the, the, the work being done with modality choice here. And we are also thinking about using it for anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation, which as you know is a very hot area and probably amenable to the use of a decision aid. So these are the, these are the tools that we need. Um, I just wanna highlight the, uh, that we've been really helped by a federal grant. So this was a national initiative on patient-oriented research generally. It was not to do with kidney disease. It was just for chronic diseases. And we have, like you, we have a, a fairly tight-knit national community of kidney researchers. And led by Braden Manns, my colleague, and Adira Levin in Vancouver, we submitted a national application to this competition, and we were successful in uh, January of this year. So $37.5 million over five years, um, which is great. But the real challenge of this is that this is a whole new world for us. We have patients are applicants on this grant. They're named applicants. Um, patients are engaged at every, every aspect of the work. And like I said before, you think that you're making great progress, you really think that, uh, that, that you're integrated and just then you have another meeting with the patient partners and you realize that you haven't uh, incorporated their input as you should and that the patients are keen to do more. So it's a learning experience for all of us. How are we gonna do this over the next five years? Um, but many of the projects that I spoke of are funded in some way by this and we're all very excited about where this might lead and we would love to collaborate with people in the United Kingdom because our health systems are so similar and clinically we think the same. So if you have any ideas about how that might work, um, please speak with me. I'd love to that, explore that with you. 
So I think in summary, I'm, this is my last slide, I just think that you know, in, in the setting of kidney disease specifically, really multimorbidity is one very important key that's gonna help move us towards patient-centeredness. And we need an array of tools to help get us there, ranging from primary care support to decision aids, and most importantly, in, um, enlightened health policy. And we need, just need to keep working on keeping the patients front and centered. I think it will have benefits for the research agenda, but I think it will definitely improve the quality of the care that we provide. I'd just like to thank my collaborators in the Alberta Kidney Disease Network that make my work so much fun, all of the policy makers that give generously of their time to help inform the studies that we're doing, and all of the people that have paid for this work in one way or another. I, love, I look forward to your questions. I think you're I think you're absolutely right there there I'll address that in two parts I think the first has to do with researchers um, from from in the research community I think it's uh, for the clinical researchers those that are doing health services population health and so on it's done people have accepted it and it's and now we're trying to deal with the challenge of how to do it properly and well basic scientists not so much still sort of thinking that this is a fad that's going to go away like, like I've said I don't think it's a fad that's going to go away I think one way or another uh, the public is demanding more accountability from all areas of life. I think research is one part of that, and I think basic scientists are, at least in Canada, they're just going to have to get with the program and move on. The clinical, the clinical uh, I think, enterprise is more interesting, <coughs> more challenging, especially um, my impression of what I've seen of the British health system is much more command and control. So if we, we can't make doctors do things because we don't have control over them, they're all independent. I mean, they have some structure, but there's not a lot of structure. You can't fire doctors, you can't cut their pay, you really can't do much to them. So everything's about the carrot, only a tiny little bit of stick. So it really has to come from a more, yeah, I don't like the word organic, but that's what it is. It has to come from the ground up. My sense is that in kidney care, the, the assets we have or the patients are already very strongly engaged. There already is a kidney foundation. Most people know about it, even if they're purely clinical, respect it. Um, the other thing is nurses and other allied health professionals. Um, my perspective, nurses, I think, already do a lot of these things. And so they're there with the patients on an ongoing basis. And so they're, if they're keen. And they, they, you know, everyone, that, that's, I think, gonna be a, a major help to those people that want to move forward a patient agenda. Still gonna be very difficult, no question. Um, I don't, we don't have the answers, but my perspective is there is gonna be more of these things. And it doesn't have to be all at once. It's just shifts in perspective, moving away from, <coughs> take these five phosphorus binders because your phosphorus will be better to just, hey, how about we talk about, you know, here's the pro and the con of that. Um, so thank you. Can I first say thank you? What you said was music to my ears. Um, I think uh, it's more a comment than, than a question, really. The way I, I've, I've seen the service develop for kidney patients in this country over, over many years now, is, is that this, these issues are not new. I think we've had short-term initiatives. You talked about uh, a care plan for patients that was launched nearly 10 years ago on World Kidney Day. But how many hospitals are actually implementing it? Very few. Renal patient view has been around for many years, and I can tell you there are hospitals around the country who don't even offer it because they don't believe in it. The question really for me is that how, so there are genuine barriers, and the gentleman was saying inspection is one, one approach, and then it's on. The other is incentives, I think. You know, if you, give, if you give financial incentives to providers, then that can change. But I want to look positively at this, and I think Fiona, the work you and others have done in, in producing the new renal strategy 
which we've talked about a number of times. You look at it and you know that patient engagement and empowerment threads through, throughout that strategy. And I think the challenge we all have now is to, in the implementation of this strategy, how we make sure that we address some of these barriers. No, I, I, I quite agree. I mean, I, um, the, I agree with everything that you've said. The, of course, I'm an enthusiast. I'm, I'm, this is something I believe in, so you're receiving an optimistic picture. There are going to be uh, steps uh, progress as well as steps backwards. My sense is that this is, again, my sense is it's not a fad, whether on the research side or the clinical side. I see real signs of change where I work, not just in Reno, but across the board. And I think part of that is a growing assertiveness among the public to hold us to what we say we're going to be doing, and if we're not yet saying it, to get us to say it, because we should be doing it anyway. So time will tell, but I, I do have an optimism that there's progress that we're going to see, uh, at least in the place, places that I work. So everyone should be aware that Curate is actually also a member of the steering group that produced the National Research Strategy in this country. One of the um, recommendations in that is that every patient should be off the opportunity to participate in research. And in my clinical service, every patient who walks through the door is asked if they'll consent to potential research. And I don't know if you have that as an aspect of your approach to engaging patients. Um, it's easy in rare disease. We've managed to achieve it nationally with radar and rare disease. It's much more difficult to coordinate yeah. in CKD or dialysis, but I think it definitely makes a difference. So we, we, um, we have been trying to implement something like this. We've run into a lot of barriers with our IRBs. Uh, we we uh, they have no problems with us asking every patient that enters about specific studies. So if we had a, a somehow a way of identifying all the studies that the person might be eligible for, we could consent them at that time. They do not currently accept the idea of a blanket consent without a specified objective. So we're not really able to do that. Uh, we continue working on that. Um, just parenthetically, what one part of uh, we, we, there's a lot of administrative and ethical uh, barriers related to the conduct of research which in our jurisdictions, uh, especially in, in one of the cities. And my perspective is the patients, the public, don't know this or understand it. And we are trying to enlist them. The patients are always surprised when we say, well, actually, we can't do this because it's forbidden by these people that are protecting you. And generally, about two-thirds of the time, people are sort of outraged and say, well, wait, uh, that's not right. I should, you know, approach me, ask me. So um, that's, that's our strategy to mitigate this. But it's a very good idea. We would like to do it. Well, one more question? Yeah. Through, your, through your talk, you didn't mention at all. Hello. Through your talk, you didn't mention smartphones at all. And um, Simon Stevens here has just released uh, healthcare innovations into health apps and the ways in which they impact on patients' outcomes. And something like my COPD education has been demonstrated to improve patient outcomes directly. And it crosses all the boundaries that you've described in this. Is that something that you're looking to develop? The, the website is useful, but often, I mean, everybody's walking around with their smartphone with it on. Yeah. And the adapted products are looking very meaningful and positive to cover both the patient-centered stuff, the communication, direct activation, and also crossing the ethics side of research and making information available to both parties because it's got essentially a front door and a back door to be, to be looked at. Yeah, so great point. The, um, the first, the top patient priority of communication, I uh, just briefly alluded to new technologies. This is one of the technologies uh, that we were speaking about. We have been um, focusing on, um, on web-based platforms so far. We certainly see the potential of mobile devices um, we need to do more exploration. So the first step was when we said that web portals were good, people said, oh, the patients are all old, there's no way they can do it. But, and so we did a national survey showing that that wasn't the case. Um, so now we're sort of at the next, the mobile phones are the next frontier where, you know, it's a smaller screen and how will people interact with it if they are patients or have visual challenges and so on. My suspicion is, once again, it's going to be applicable for lots of people, but we haven't yet gathered those data and we're currently focused on web portals. But great suggestion. If you just as an aside, if you ask your elderly patient, can you meet us on a certain date, I bet they get their phone out of their I, diary. I, I, I hear it's you. the first thing that happens, I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. don't worry, it. it's fine. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, thank you again for a really excellent talk. I know we could continue this discussion all afternoon. Um, you've kindly said that you're going to